Fora TV. The world is thinking. Welcome to Boozy Britain. Are we a nation of alcoholics and binge drinkers? I see there's a few people whooping in the background. Uh, um, so we'll look forward to hearing from you. Um, I don't think there's any real need to ask, uh, you know, to say why we're discussing this. It's been a huge story. Uh, I mean, obviously alcohol's always been a big issue uh, 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 in any society, I suppose. But it's been a huge story over the last year. Um, constant newspaper coverage. Uh, not just about drunkenness in city centres, which is always a, uh, a, a good one for the newspapers, but also about uh, major increases in the number of people admitted to A&E for alcohol-related reasons. The middle classes quietly sozzling their wine at home and injuring their health and uh, uh, possibly other things at the same time. Um, and, of course, the outrageous supermarkets selling uh, alcohol cheaply, uh, which is appalling. And um, a significant increase in uh, liver cirrhosis, uh, and also high-profile uh, government came, uh, excuse me, campaigns about knowing your limits, which, by their calculations, I have to say are rather depressingly low. And I ma imagine it's probably why some of you are here, uh, uh, to find out about that. Um, so there's a lot going on. Um, also, I think there's a very important question for us to pursue, which is about well, what is the evidence about uh, alcohol uh, within this country and its impact on our health? But perhaps equally as importantly, how is that evidence presented? Are we being given uh, a one-sided story? For example, we hear a lot about uh, uh, healthier attitudes and approaches to alcohol in, in Europe, about their cafe culture. We hear less often how uh, actually the UK uh, average levels of alcohol consumption are far lower uh, than most <coughs> European countries. And I think we come around about 12th in the league, league table uh, amongst EU countries. And we're not there at the top. And a huge controversy over the advice given to pregnant women uh, last year, and I think it was about May 2007, the Department of Health changed its advice uh, uh, for pregnant women to drink no alcohol at all. Uh, advice which was uh, uh, at odds with the Royal College uh, of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists and the National Institute of Clinical Excellence. But by March 2008, uh, they had changed their position to fall in line with Liam Donaldson, uh, uh, ex explaining uh, that the advice was tightened partly because of the recognition of the harm of it, excessive drinking uh, it was doing in society generally. So I think there's a very important question there about the politicisation of evidence uh, and, and whether that is going on in relation to this debate that we need to address. OK, so without further ado, to introduce our panel, um, we discussed this upstairs <coughs> about how to do it, and it was decided that the prosecution are to go first. Uh, uh, and so we have, first of all, Dr Gray Smith-Lang, uh, who is a consultant uh, gastroenterologist at Medway Maritime Hospital. Um, he uh, uh, has been there since 1984. He has specialist interests, and this is where I'm going to uh, show my inability to pronounce certain medical words, uh, <coughs> hepatology, interve interventional uh, endoscopy, endoscopy. endoscopy. <laughs> ERCP, and colonoscopy. colonoscopy. Uh, 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 ex excuse me. Anyway, so those are his specialist interests, and uh, you'll all be appalled by my uh, pronunciation. Uh, he's also very uh, uh, keen to remain true uh, to the idea of being a general physician. Uh, and he was particularly prominent uh, in uh, discussing these issues in the media um, through quite a, a, a brave uh, uh, a project he did with Paul Watson, the documentary uh, filmmaker. Uh, when he, uh, he negotiated uh, for Paul Watson to be able to film uh, within his hospital uh, uh, the treatment of patients and uh, uh, in, in the film called Rolling My Heart, which is a very, very hard-hitting and, and very interesting uh, and important documentary uh, about our colleagues uh, 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 in, in Medway. Um, OK, so that's uh, Dr Graysmith Lang. Uh, next to speak will be Claire Girarda. Uh, welcome to Claire. Claire is the Vice Chair of the Royal College of General Practitioners. Uh, she's been a GP in Lambeth since 1991. Before that, she worked in psychiatry at the Maudsley Hospital, uh, specialising in substance misuse. Uh, and that's something that she uh, retains very strong professional interest in. Uh, so we'll have lots to say uh, today. Next then, and uh, uh, in this uh, uh, setup, in terms of uh, first for the uh, defence, as it were, we have Dr Mike Fitzpatrick. He's a GP in Hackney with a long-standing interest in politics, 
the history of ideas and contemporary attacks on reason, science and rationality. He writes regularly uh, for the online journal Spiked and The Lancet uh, and, and many other publications. He's the author of three books, The Tyranny of Health, Doctors and the Regulation of Lifestyle, particularly <coughs> pertinent to, to today's debate, uh, an extremely well-received and <coughs> highly regarded book uh, on MMR and autism, and now his latest book, Pursuing That Theme, Defeating Autism, A Damaging Delusion, uh, an important book uh, uh, that was published just this week and available on Amazon. Um, next after Mike will be Peter Marsh, who is a chartered psychologist and co-director of the Social Issues Research Centre, a centre he co-founded with Kate Fox in 1997. It's done excellent work on getting behind uh, important issues like alcohol, uh, the obesity debate, uh, to really try and dig out what's going on behind uh, the media headlines. He's still known for his early work on football hooliganism, and his first book, Rules of Disorder, was published in 1978, and his latest, Football Hooliganism, uh, was published in 2005, and he was speaking earlier today about that very thing. Okay, those are our panellists. Without further ado, Fred, please. <coughs> Um, I think I should set the scene first. Uh, I do drink, and in fact last night, probably courtesy of our host, I was almost certainly a binge drinker. I don't represent the BMA in this discussion. I don't represent the Royal College of Physicians in this discussion. Now, in terms of background, I have a French mother, so I was taught the continental way of drinking. And I had a Scottish father who managed to drink his way through two marriages uh, and whose parenting skills were somewhat uh, delinquent. I spent 40 years watching people die from alcohol-related diseases, and most of it liver disease. So I have a long experience, and uh, I do know what I'm talking about. I think the topics that we need to cover today are to ask a very fundamental question. Is there actually a problem with alcohol? Why is there so much confusion is the second question. The third thing we need to address is at what level should doctors and the government be involved in dealing with this problem if we feel that the government should be involved at all. Um, and fourthly, what are we going to do about the problem? How are we going to tackle it if we agree that it actually exists? Now, in terms of whether there is a problem with alcohol, there is a huge weight of statistical evidence to show that there is a problem. Alcohol consumption has gone up steadily over the last 50 years. You can forget the minor decline over the last three or four years. <laughs> uh, hospital admissions have risen steadily. Deaths associated either directly or linked with alcohol have steadily increased. And probably the simplest marker with which I'm familiar is the number of deaths from liver cirrhosis. Uh, and that has probably doubled over the last 10 years or so. But however you look at the statistics, they are fairly compelling. Unlike the police statistics on violent crime, personal observation accords very much with the statistics. I've been a consultant for nearly 25 years now. When I started, I have to tell you, I was pleasantly surprised at the lack of alcoholic liver disease that I saw. Now, running a ward of about 24 beds at any given time between a third, uh, around a third of the beds will be occupied by men and women with alcoholic liver disease, uh, and we see the age coming down, and although men still predominate, the women are catching up very rapidly. So that evidence is there. You can speak to a gastroenterologist from any point of the compass, and you will hear exactly the same story. There is also a weight of epidemiological evidence to show that all alcohol is bad for full stop. Now, clearly, the risk changes as you go up, so there is a level at which the risk is negligible or very small, but there are a whole host of diseases, including a variety of cancers, including breast cancer, which you might not think should be linked, colon cancer, cancer of the esophagus, liver disease, pancreatic disease, heart disease, neurological disorders. In all, there are about 60 conditions which you can directly link with excessive alcohol intake. Uh, and most of these, uh, if they do not kill the patient, seriously diminish their capacity to enjoy a normal, healthy life. So we're talking about uh, badly damaged people. And by the time you recognize that alcohol has caused that damage, it's usually far too late. So I don't have any problem with the notion that alcohol causes health problems and the problems are increasing in number. We can discuss safe units for drinking later because I'm sure that will come up in discussion. I think there was a huge amount of confusion about alcohol and that's because of the terminology that is used. If somebody says to you, hazardous drinking is different from harmful drinking, 
why, you know, what's the difference between something that is hazardous and harmful? And when is somebody addicted to alcohol? When is somebody abusing alcohol, etc., etc., etc.? So there is a whole range of uh, terminology out there, most of which is not agreed internationally, most of which is quite difficult to comprehend. And there was one term which I particularly know, which is the term binge drinker. I think it is totally unhelpful, and it disengages people from thinking about their own personal drinking habits, because they simply do not wish to be associated with the term binge drinking. I would like to propose a completely different definition of alcoholism or alcohol <coughs> problems, and this is people who drink at a level which either harms or threatens to harm them and the people around them. And that's because drinking is not a solitary problem. It almost always involves others. Nearest and dearest are usually the most likely to be involved. There could be innocent bystanders, people involved in road traffic accidents. And only two weeks ago, a pilot was arrested at the point of takeoff with a Boeing 747 full of people. He was drunk. So alcohol can damage people in a very vicarious and rather distant manner, as well as people who are close to people who drink too much. I'd also like to divide people who drink too much into two groups. There are people whom I think we would all recognise as people with a major problem with alcohol, or alcoholics, if you want to use that term. These are people who drink too much who are totally incapable of controlling their alcohol intake. And these are people who, on the whole, have had shitty lives. They have a huge version of, of psychiatric disease, uh, and they need a properly constructed and humane and coherent pathway of care, which is not provided currently by the health service. And that's a major, major flaw. And then there is a much larger number of people who drink at risk, and some of whom will be harming themselves, who do it through peer pressure, ignorance, work pressure, etc., 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 in whom small interventions, education, being made to realise they're at risk from their drinking, may well prove extremely beneficial. Uh, and that's a much easier group to deal with. It's much larger, but it is easier to deal with. Now, at what level should we as doctors and the government involve themselves? Well, doctors clearly get involved with their patients, so this is very much a one-to-one -one thing. Um, when you have the sorts of numbers of people who drink excessively that are running into millions, it promptly becomes a public health problem, and when it's a public health problem, it has to involve the government. There are huge sums of money which this nation has to pay to sweep up the problems caused by the alcohol industry. They trouser a huge profit, they <coughs> do nothing towards the damage. We are picking up a bill which is variously estimated between 20 and 50 billion per annum. Now, if we mention these sums in connection with the banking crisis, we have a national heart attack and a nervous fit, but somehow this passes everybody by when it's seen in the context of alcohol abuse. But it's a huge sum of money and we pay year in and year out. So the government has to be involved at that level. What are we going to do about the problem? I think that really is very difficult. Um, I think there are the one-to-one -one interventions with doctors, although education is said not to be an effective uh, uh, way of approaching the problem. I think there is a great role for public education. Uh, we can come back to the safe drinking units message uh, in a little while. Um, and I think we need to develop a proper pathway of care uh, for alcoholics. This has been dealt with by NICE, but uh, that needs to go on. So in conclusion, I don't have the slightest difficulty there is a problem. I think it's a major problem. I think it is growing and it requires <coughs> medical attention urgently. Uh, primary care would be the best place to put this. A huge amount of use of activity occurs in primary care. Making blood fats in 80-year-olds is a complete waste of time. <laughs> Two minutes talking to patients about their alcohol intake and doing a little questionnaire would be time more profitably spent. And then the government must be involved, you know, whether it's <coughs> advertising, discussing the units message, health education, or finally we have to discuss statutory controls. Uh, the government has to be involved. I have no doubt about that at all. Thank you very much, Greg. Thank you very much. I'm a general practitioner. I, again, not representing the RCGP. I work in Lambeth and in Southwark and see a fair amount of problems related to alcohol. About one in three of my patients every single day that consult with me are there for a problem that's directly or indirectly related to alcohol. And be sure, these are all ages, from the young right through to the 85-year-old, both sexes and all ethnic groups. Alcohol 
Everyone in this room, bar a handful, will drink. And in my surgery, I see problems right across the socioeconomic uh, groups. As a doctor, I think it is my responsibility to speak out. I think it is my responsibility in those of my profession to say something has to be done. As a doctor, I think, and I echo Gray, I think we're entering sleepwalking into the biggest public health disaster we face. Alcohol causes more problems than any other of the licit or illicit drugs put together. Problems to the individual, problems to communities and problems to families. We know about dementia, we know about cirrhosis, cancers and heart disease. Around about every Saturday night, two-thirds of anybody in an A&E department is there for an alcohol-related issue. 50% of all violent crime is alcohol-related an untold amount of, of accident. So I think the evidence is indisputable and we could fill this room and there's a picture over there of a body. I teach my students that alcohol can affect any part of the body and they usually then try to catch me out and say, what about the toenails then? And then we go and debate, well, it can also affect the toenails. The problem is controlling alcohol and dealing with it. Alcohol is not easy to control. It's not like tobacco. Tobacco has taken 15 years to reach the state we're in. Alcohol is much more complex. It's much more complex because there is uh, a, a very small number of diseases, or very small numbers of conditions that alcohol can probably benefit. And there is also a great deal to be said that alcohol in, in moderate uh, amounts is enjoyable and we shouldn't be banning things that are enjoyable. All of us drink. I drank last night, maybe not as much as uh, cause I wasn't here. What I think, though, is that the government has let us down. Before I was a GP, I was a senior policy advisor at the Department of Health, uh, responsible for drug and alcohol policy. The scale of funding for substance misuse for illicit drugs such as heroin outreached the amount that was spent on alcohol by about 20 to 1. The government, for whatever you think, does not have an alcohol policy. Its alcohol policy that it has relies almost entirely on the, on the industry to self-regulate, entirely on the industry to reduce the amount of direct advertising and to make safer drink drinking by putting uh, uh, units on on their bottles, which something as simple as that has taken around about 20 years uh, to get agreement, and it's by far not all bottled. I think, as a doctor, I have to speak out. I see every day, as I've said, the consequences of alcohol. I pick up the pieces of despair. My profession sees around a million people a day, and therefore I think as a GP, we are responsible for being barometers of the public's health and actually speaking out where we see the public's health are being harmed. I think that the only way forward is government response. I don't think it's my job as a GP to be trying to deal with it on my own in the consulting room. I do try, and I think there's a great deal of evidence for what we call brief intervention. But I think the only way of dealing with this is through a national alcohol policy that addresses advertising, that addresses access, and also addresses affordability and makes the price of alcohol proportionate to the strength of the alcohol and not, as we see now, uh, where you can pick up a bottle of vodka for as little as two pounds if you search in the supermarket. So we'll be hearing soon from the defence. I would like to close by saying I believe that alcohol... I believe that alcohol is, as I said, the biggest public health problem we face. As a GP, I feel I have a duty to speak out, and I feel that I have a duty to be lobbying those that are of the power to change, to make sure they change before all of us uh, reap the consequences of our excess drinking. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. <laughs> OK, Mike. Thank you. Well, I certainly wouldn't dispute that alcohol causes damage to health. Um, I th I'm sure there isn't a person in this room that hasn't got a personal experience of the damage that health can do to themselves or to their family or to their close friends. I think this is well understood. What I want to argue in this discussion is that because something has consequences for health, does not make it ipso facto a medical problem. That seems to me the problem of this whole discussion about alcohol and the role of doctors in it. It's a very 
alluring prospect. If you're a doctor, as Gray has described, and as Claire has also, and you experience every day of the week the consequences of alcohol in terms of people's health, to think, if only I could do something to, pre to, to prevent this, it would make my life much easier. And to retreat then from the area of dealing with the problems as they present in your surgery into some other area where you believe that something you may do may have something, uh, may do something to prevent the problems that you see uh, in your surgery every day of the week. The difficulty lies in whether or not the measures that you're proposing, you know, uh, as Claire says, she feels a responsibility to speak out. What is she saying in terms of what should be done in terms of uh, what may be helpful in terms of preventing uh, problems of alcohol? And what I'm concerned about is that what we're seeing here is part of a much wider trend, actually, is, is the retreat of doctors from the sphere of their own expertise, which is in the di diagnosis and the uh, treatment of disease, into other areas, taking on the role of other sorts of uh, uh, professionals, in a sense, of politicians making social policy, making legislation, of priests preaching to people how they should change their behaviour, or indeed of the shock jock, you know, of uh, 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 appearing on television chat shows and radio shows uh, with a sort of repent the end is nigh, we were in terrible grip of a terrible epidemic, uh, the, something must be done, uh, the uh, uh, we're sleepwalking into disaster, nightmare scenarios, we're all going to be uh, uh, dying from these terrible diseases and promoting uh, alarming figures of the enormous costs of these problems. Not to say that there aren't, but there's always a tendency greatly to exaggerate this problem and to promote uh, alarm and, uh, uh, and uh, anxiety around these issues because that's held to be useful in terms of promoting some sort of intervention. Now, it's interesting to look at these sort of things historically because, you know, we've been here before. It's quite interesting to see that there have been periods historically when the alcohol has become the major focus of political and cultural debate. And we seem to be entering into a period like this again now. We had it in the, in the middle of the 18th century in the great gin craze in London. We had it in the early 19th century with the first phase of the temperance movement. We had it in the uh, beginning of this century with the revival of the temperance movement, not in just in this country, but internationally, which culminated in the United States most notoriously in the episode of Prohibition, generally agreed to have been a, a catastrophically disastrous intervention of the state in trying to regulate alcohol uh, and caused a whole sort of problem of crime from which the USA has yet to recover. So all these uh, we seem to be entering again, and then we had a period of where alcohol, quite interesting, I was reading the introduction to a uh, historical discussion of the temperance movement published in the 60s, which begins off with a thing saying, it's interesting, nobody is interested in alcohol anymore because people think the alcohol question has been solved. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the, the second edition of the book published in the 90s saying, great, now this book's becoming much more uh, of interest because now there's a return of alcohol to public discussion. But it's quite interesting, during the whole post-war period, there was no discussion of alcohol. Not that people weren't drinking themselves to death in that period. They were, obviously. Not that alcohol wasn't causing an enormous amount of health and social problems during that period and destroying individual health and families as it's always done. But it just wasn't an issue of uh, major social and political concern. And so what you see around this is, is periodic upsurges of uh, uh, concern about this, which combine two elements. I, I don't think it is just a moral panic that just uh, comes up from time to time. Usually there is some change in the way in which alcohol is dealt with in society, as I think there's been over the last 10 years. Uh, you know, we can discuss what the, the factors are involved in that is. But um, no doubt there is something uh, of that nature. But there is a, a, always a wider cultural and political context which leads to alcohol becoming a major focus uh, of concern. And it always involves a combination of medical and uh, uh, religious, historically anyway, religious uh, evangelical preachers. There's always been a moral and a, and a medical element to it. What was, what's distinctive about the current uh, mode of uh, the phase of this, which is reflected in this platform, is the ascendancy of the medical profession. We have three doctors and a psychologist on this platform. I don't think that would have been the case in a temperance discussion in the early years of this century. Uh, but we have now, in a way, the Salvation Army without the brass band, uh, which may or may, may not be considered to be progress. The, the, the theme that constantly strikes me about this discussion in the, in the contemporary phase uh, it really came out to me out of a, an article I read in a major feature in The Guardian a, a month ago, and this d debate was first mentioned. A uh, whole section about the problems of alcohol in society, and the, the Conclusion of it was, in bold print, your GP is the first place to turn to if you're concerned about your drinking. Why, I thought to myself, you know, why on earth would anybody think the GP was the person to go to of problems of drinking? Other than the fact that, you know, the, the traditional GP definition of an alcoholic is somebody who drinks more than he drinks. 
Uh, I also read somewhere that if you're, if you're concerned about al the cirrhosis of the liver, the occupation which has the highest risk of cirrhosis of the liver after barman is GPs. So perhaps this confers some particular expertise in this area, but whether that's of any value to the patient would be a, another question. But it is remarkable how this features in every... The National Audit uh, Office published another... These reports come out almost every week now. National Audit Office, one last week, reducing alcohol harm. The central theme of it, which is the role of... Uh, uh, the, the central theme is the role of GPs in dealing with and the critique that primary care trusts are not doing enough to incentivise GPs to monitor their patients' drinking habits, to, register, to, to record them, to screen them, and to intervene uh, to, to deal with them. And the central theme of this report, and that all these, there's a whole series of them, and an enormous amount of, of policy making around this whole area. The central theme is that early intervention in problems, uh, problem drinking can reduce the enormous burden of costs later, both in terms of ill health and the cost of the, everybody of this treatment. And of course, that is, that's what everybody would like to see. If only we could intervene early to prevent it, then we wouldn't have to deal with this. And this point is repeated three times in this, in this brief summary of the whole thing. Early intervention will reduce the burden of later costs. But what is the evidence that this is true? You know, this is actually a, 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 a new form of one of the oldest fallacies in the health service, the, titled by, as a beverage fallacy in honour of William Beveridge, who founded the National Health Service. And Beveridge's famous fallacy was that early expenditure on the National Health Service in prevention, uh, in, in improving people's quality of health, would lead to reduced health expenditure. So they, that was the whole idea of the health service. He thought that as time went by, the, the spending on health would decrease when the health service came in. Well, of course, exactly the opposite uh, came to pass. And it's a simple reason that, that the idea that if you spend more in prevention, it, it, it only, is only going to uh, uh, deliver long-term results if the prevention is effective in relation to the problem that's targeted. And this is the central problem about uh, uh, the, the, the intervention in alcohol. Claire... Sk uh, skated over very discreetly, I thought, the issue of brief interventions. Because the brief intervention in general practice is the central theme of every policy in this whole area. This is what is the key to success. Brief interventions by GPs and they, all these documents proclaim there is a robust evidence that brief interventions by GPs, 20-minute consultation, brief intervention, talking to patients who are, are showing, are showing in, on screening tests to, to have harmful level of drink, is very effective in preventing long-term drinking uh, habits. And you only have to look at that. You think, you know, that's brilliant if it was true. But, it, you know, you stand back from it. It couldn't possibly be true. You know, that all, all that's needed is for a GP to talk to the patient for 10 minutes and everything is going to be solved. You know, we're in, we're in fantasy land here. This is wishful thinking <laughs> elevated to the level of government policy. But yet, robust evidence is claimed for the efficacy of brief interventions by GPs. GPs talk to patients for 10 or 20 minutes. Now, you look at the robust evidence uh, that's presented for this, and you'll see a whole number of things how this robust evidence is con constructed. First of all, you exclude from your study anybody who is dependent on alcohol, right? So you exclude alcoholics. So you only include people with harmful or hazardous, so in other words, lower key problems of drinking. You then redefine what, what is considered to be effective. You know, is it stopping drinking entirely? No. Reju any reduction in alcohol consumption is considered to be effective. Indeed, any reduction in episodes of so-called binge drinking, however that's defined. So that's all that's required to show efficacy. The other thing that is very important to do is to shorten the time over which you d decide whether the, the intervention has been effective. Most of the studies are only for a few weeks, at the most a few months, none for longer than a year. So you can show, in other words, if GPs talk to people for 10 or 20 minutes, it might reduce the amount they drink for a very short period of time for the people who don't drink very much in the first place. And this is robust evidence of the efficacy of brief interventions, which is on which a whole now uh, body of government policy, and as a GP, I'm shortly going to be paid major incentive for uh, 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 delivering this, this uh, intervention with patients. <coughs> Systematic reviews of this have actually exposed this. It's quite interesting if you look in the, in the literature, exposed the, uh, the scam that is, uh, this is effectively what this is. And, you know, very interesting, provokes an outraged, how can anybody say that these studies don't show that the, the, the very act of critically appraising studies of such low quality is subversive of this public health message and scandalous to the public to suggest that brief interventions by GPs are not incredibly effective, uh, central cutting edge of government policy in this area. So it's totally useless. But the, it's just a fantasy. You can see it. It's the, the, the strength of that everybody wants it to be true is so great that it constructs scientific evidence to justify it. And, of course, this is not an entirely unfamiliar issue in government policy generally. Um, so it's no good. 
But people say, all right, it doesn't work, OK. And people say this now about education, the education programmes in schools, which is one health to be good. What we need to do is teach the children that alcohol is bad. If only the people knew that alcohol wasn't good for them, then they wouldn't drink so much. Another fantasy, you know? Uh, but this was, uh, now people have said, actually, that is entirely ineffective, and so it's moved on to brief interventions in general practice. But say, so, all right, it doesn't do any good, but what harm? It's no harm to, if GPs explain to patients that drinking is not good for you, it doesn't do any harm. Well, I think it does do harm in two ways. First of all, it infantilizes patients. This idea that you, you screen everybody coming into your patient, ask them how much they drink, and then start lecturing them about their drinking habits. This, uh, this is the notion of of uh, good medical practice is, uh, to me, to, uh, demeaning to the relationship between the doctor and the patient. It's quite interesting how contrary it is to the prevailing ethos of general practice, which is very critical of traditional paternalism, you know, the paternalistic relationship of the GP to the patient. But you see the brief intervention in drinking entirely relies upon a paternalistic relation between the GP and the patient. That is the ba uh, What other basis would a, G would a patient change their behaviour in response to their GP other than their deference to a traditional authority figure who is telling them some information and uh, urging them and exhorting them to change their behaviour in relation to that. That is based on a paternalistic relationship. And uh, it's, uh, 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 you know, it seems to me not something which is at all useful to per perpetuate in, uh, in general practice in any way. It's also, it seems to me, degrading to doctors. It reduces general practice to the whole, the, the, the role of a doctor is not to uh, deal with the problem that the patient presents to them in terms of seeing what is the, uh, the nature of their illness, what kind of treatment can they offer th to them, but to exhort them to change their behavior to, to, to in some way that's held to be uh, improve their health. Uh, that seems to me to be uh, uh, not a, 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 a useful form of medical practice in terms of either the patient or the doctor, or indeed the whole practice of medicine is reduced to a, a, a sort of form of uh, hectoring and exhortation uh, packaged in a, in a sort of modern form. Not, not one of the other, just uh, 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 other relatively minor aspects of it, is as part of a wider whole thing, the extent to which this sort of activity is now taking over the world of general practice. Because it's not only as a GP am I obliged to uh, uh, counsel and exhort patients in relation to alcohol, I keep a file of things, the social problems which a GP is ideally placed to intervene in. And it includes domestic violence, teenage pregnancy, uh, elder abuse, uh, drug abuse, the list is just endless of things in which GPs are, 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 are supposed to be in an ideal position to lecture their patients about. <laughs> uh, in fact, one of these papers that's critical of the uh, alcohol uh, brief intervention uh, thing makes the point that if, if this is on, on the basis of American health promotion advice, if GPs followed the, uh, to the letter the health promotion activities that they're supposed to engage in, it would take 7.4 hours a day uh, in their uh, working day in relation to patients. I've now got to wind up, and I'll wind up with a, just a, put to you a very uh, a wise words written by H.L. Mencken in response to the prohibition wave in the, uh, America in the 1920s. The role of doctors is not to make people virtuous, virtuous, but to save them from the consequences of their vices. True physician, the true physician does not preach repentance, he offers absolution. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> Alcohol consumption is bad for your health. We've yet to hear what is excessive, for whom might those amounts be excessive, when is it excessive, and so on. But I'm sure we'll come into the nitty um, gritty. But so what? Are people no longer allowed to be unhealthy? Are people no longer allowed to take health risks if they choose to do so? You know, I think about bungee jumping and rugby playing and all sorts of other activities that might be seen as sort of kind of wicked in this context as well. Skiing, I speak from experience, pretty dangerous stuff that hurts. And do we really need what I see as this kind of sort of burgeoning army of health professionals, not just doctors, medical doctors and GPs, but a whole um, cast of health professionals and educators rushing around repeating what we already know, that drinking too much um, is bad for us. You know, it's bad for our liver, heart, lots of other things. And do we really need the subtext that goes with this coercion that I see? The idea not only is it making an, uh, us unhealthy, but it is because we are bad people. This is already cropped up, I think, in Claire, who's saying that you know, our drinking habits are costing the country 
between 20 and 50 billion pounds a year. And where those figures come from is um, anybody's guess. But basically, what she's saying is that we are worse than hedge fund managers, the people who are single-handedly responsible for the credit crunch, crunch. And you really can't get much more insulting, it seems to me, than that. Now, there was a time, of course, not long ago, and uh, Mike has touched on this, when drinking, and certainly drinking to excess, was sinful. And it was the church and the temperance movements coming out of the Puritan traditions of this society which led the anti-alcohol um, lobbies. Now the formal religions have declined, religion generally has, has gone down, but it's been replaced. It's been replaced by the new dogma of healthism, the idea that we have a duty to be healthy. Now, this to me is a very uncomfortable kind of slogan. Um, it comes directly from the notion of the German notion of Gesundheitist Pflicht, which was one of the um, dogmas of Germany, Nazi Germany in the 1930s. And there are uncomfortable parallels, I think, about this idea that you have to legislate to make people be healthy. It leads to all sorts of other, um, perhaps, um, rather unfortunate consequences. So, but this idea that the old temperance notion of sin and the new concept of health seem to me to be very much in the similar sort of category. They're just in different kind of wrappers. The same basic rationales and dogma underlie both of them. And it's those temperance traditions which continue, which in my view are actually responsible for the very problems that we are now debating. In Anglo-Saxon and Nordic countries in particular, they've led to what is known as a cultural ambivalence about alcohol. We recognize that it has a role in, say, celebrations, but we also see it as dangerous, something that has to be controlled, regulated, hedged around with all sorts of restrictions. And those patterns of cultural ambivalence contrast markedly with the more integrated approaches that you get in most other cultures around the world, and particularly in southern Europe, where alcohol, alcohol consumption is just incorporated into um, everyday life. And certainly if you go to Italy, a few years ago we were doing some work on football and alcohol-related violence in Italy. And asking Italians, did they think you know, there was a relationship between drinking and violence? And they simply couldn't understand the question. It was a bit like asking them, do you think there is a, a relationship between tortellini and violence? Like, you know, you mad English people, of course not. And of course it's in Italy that if people do get extremely angry, extremely aggressive, someone goes and gets a very large brandy to calm them down. Quite the opposite of the expectations that we have of what alcohol is going to do. So, <coughs> temperance still wears, it's still there, but it now wears a medical white coat rather than a, a vicar's cap, it seems to me. But in case you thought that kind of temperance itself had gone away, then all you have to do is to look at a lot of the so-called scientific material on alcohol and its ill effects that comes from organizations such as the Institute for Alcohol Studies, a, a big leading so-called scientific body um, devoted to looking at the harmful effects of alcohol. Now. The IAS, the Institute of Alcohol Studies, is entirely funded and is a wholly owned subsidiary of an organization which until a couple of years ago was called the UK Temperance Alliance. They have now, for some reason, changed their name to Alliance House, but their aims and object objectives are exactly the same. So we see this temperance undercurrent running right through the debates, this attempt that we need to regulate, to control alcohol, <coughs> which, in my view, is undoubtedly going to make our cultural ambivalence stronger and the kind of problems that we experience as a result um, even greater. So I think we need to move away from that to celebrating alcohol, to having positive expectations of what alcohol will do, seeing alcohol as a force for good. At the moment, we see it almost uniquely as a force for bad. So Stella Artois, for example, is routinely um, referred to in pubs as wife beater. You know, you can order two pints of wife beater because that is the assumption it's going to have on our behavior. And that leads to a self-fulfilling prophecy. 
you know, because you've drunk two pints of Stella, you can now say, well, that's why I smacked him in the mouth, and people will excuse you on the basis that those are the well-known, well-understood consequences. <coughs> we have to get away from that, to get away from the medical view of alcohol and to see it as a sort of in its proper social context um, and the positive benefits that can accrue. One final point I want to make before I get waved at by Tony. We were sitting upstairs, and Tony was doing the sort of typical um, nostalgia stuff about E when I were a lad, you know. We used to go out drinking, but we didn't get into the sort of kind of state that the people do today. Binge drinking, you know, it's... <laughs> Oh, how I put it. <laughs> that's, exa that's exactly how you put it. So, <laughs> in keeping with the sort of kind of line I've been taking on the um, temperance movement, I mean, one of the best books ever written about drinking yeah, comes from the Mass Observation Unit and Tom Harrison. It's a book which was published just after the Second World War, but the research was actually done in 1938. And if you want to get a view of the kind of timelessness of the problems that are associated with cultural ambivalence about alcohol, this is the best place to go. <coughs> so, binge drinking is new, right. At closing time, back and front streets are crowded, some people dancing, men and women doing foxtrots, trying to do a fling. Observers estimate 25% of the crowd are drunk. Along the promenade, the area is full of beer smell that overcomes sea smell. It arises from people breathing, a swirling, moving mass of mostly drunks, singing, playing, groups dancing about. Chaps fall over, their friends pick them up. At one point, a young man falls flat on his face. His friend picks him up and puts him over his shoulder and lurches away with him. Immediately, a fight starts among four young men. <coughs> the crowd simply opens up to give them elbow room as it flows by. Some others stop to look. One of the fighters is knocked out cold. Others carry him back to a stall and dump him there. Back streets are not so densely crowded, but even more drunks. In a litter of broken glass and bottles, a woman sits by herself, being noisily sick. Now, that is not the consequence of this huge rise of consumption we've heard about since the 1960s. This is 1938. So I think we need a different perspective altogether. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. <coughs> okay, before I turn the panel over to all of you, just a couple of questions first of all. <coughs> this is a very, very important issue, whichever way you look at it. I mean, there's your perspective and there's the other perspectives. From my point of view, a huge amount of money is going into advertising campaigns and targeting people to change their behaviour. Now, it's not just about money well spent, it's about the impact that has on people uh, in terms of you know, how they regard themselves, uh, uh, the, their level of anxiety about the sort of lifestyle choices they may want to wait, make. Uh, uh, um, so this seems to be fundamentally important. So I, I just want to ask, first of all, Gray and, and Claire in particular, just to clarify the situation. It seems to be you're, you've made your case that uh, an increase in consumption, increase in disease, Mike said... Yeah, it seems like there is something going on. There usually is uh, uh, when these issues uh, come to the surface, but that's not all that's going on. But nonetheless, liver cirrhosis, deaths have doubled from 4,000 to 8,000. It's obviously very regrettable, but it's a narrow pool of people. Traditionally, we've got an image of an alcoholic, and then there's everybody else. How do you make the case that all alcohol is bad for you? How do you make the case uh, that there's this other very large number of people who are at risk, but they just don't know it, and that they're suffering uh, serious consequences? Can you substantiate that? Because I've not heard anything that convinces me so far. Well, uh, the headline figure about the number of deaths, of course, only represents that proportion of patients dying each year from their liver disease. So there's a much bigger pool of patients the types of damage that you get from alcohol uh, are seen mainly in the chronic drinkers, but you could be a young man going on your first big binge, you could have a, an attack of acute pancreatitis, and if it didn't kill you, it could leave you in permanent, lifelong ill health. One binge drink, and, and I'm using binge in the colloquial sense, I think, every session. So uh, there is more uh, ill health out there associated with alcohol than the headline figures for the number of deaths. Isn't that cirrhosis. scaremongering? One no. binge drink and you're dead. Well, it's not scaremongering. It's just a very simple fact. You haven't seen these people. What's the likelihood? Well, now that's another very important question. 
about what is the likelihood. And this is, this is where we get into the, the very difficult area about what is safe drinking. In all disease, but alcohol is a very good example of alcohol-related disease, there is a continuum of effects. So there is no point where you can say something is safe and then it promptly becomes unsafe. So there are people who get significant damage at relatively small levels of alcohol consumption over relatively short periods, and they tend on the whole to be women. And there are other people who, as you know, drink, smoke all their lives and have nothing to show for it and die at 90. So I asked a very simple question. Yes. What's the okay, okay. Well, Can I answer that? Excuse me. Yeah, the, I'll the, likelihood, the, the likelihood is very low, but if it happens to you, it's 100%, and your life is permanently altered. So I don't go around saying to people, you know, don't go through the rites of passage of, of being a student or whatever and have a few <coughs> sessions. But people do need to know that there's potentially a risk. When you get into steady heavy drinking, then there is a very easily quantifiable risk. Uh, and we know that when you start drinking heavily, if we say go above 50 units a week, um, and many people are drinking well over 100 units a week, and don't seem to regard it as at all unsafe, you run a very significant risk of running into ill health. Okay. Can, Thank you, can I just clarify? I'm not an, an abstinence, uh, into abstinence or temperance. What I am is a GP who sees every single day consequences of disease caused by alcohol, which unfortunately people don't know. I'm not being patronising. The amount of people, including my own profession, that don't know, for example, that alcohol contributes to high blood pressure, uh, especially in men. The amount <coughs> of people, women, who don't know that alcohol contributes to breast cancer. The number of people from my own profession who don't know that alcohol contributes to strokes, to mouth cancers, to stomach cancers. I'm not into an abstinence model. I'm into a sensible drinking model. In terms of the risks and harms and what GPs can do, I'm slightly disingenuous uh, from what Mike said. Brief intervention does work, but not with those who are already dependent, not with those who are already uh, having craving, who have withdrawals, who, who have uh, all the symptoms and, and features of alcohol dependence. But those that come into my surgery that I identify as hi hypertensive, and I, I ask them, unlike a lot of my profession, what are they drinking? They are so grateful when actually I say, listen, you know, you're drinking 40, 50 units a week. Cut it back to 20 units and you'll find your BP goes down. And lo and behold, it does go down. We make more fuss about salt and salt in supermarkets than we do about what's staring us in the face, alcohol. I enjoy a drink, as all of you do. One in ten of you in this audience will be dependent. Of those uh, under 65, 15% of all deaths in under 65s are alcohol-related. We can pour the statistics. I, we could fill this room with evidence. If you want to believe in the conspiracy theory that all the evidence is, is, is flawed, then so be it. Uh, but uh, I'm not, I, I have no, no axe to grind. I'm not a vested interest. I don't belong to a temperance uh, 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 group. I'm just a GP who has seen this for 25 years and feel passionate that we need to start opening a debate and stop being <laughs> stupid about alcohol. Okay, thanks. Mike, so over to you. If there is something going on and that people are consuming more and it is having a, a negative impact on their lives, if it's not the GPs, then who? You see, I think people, if, you know, people know it, People know alcohol is not good for them. I don't believe this that class that you know that the people are, are walking around in this. It's just that people's drinking behaviour has got nothing to do with their concerns about their health. That's the point. People drink for a whole variety of reasons. The problem with I mean, alcohol is always going to be a problem because we live in a society where alcohol is a major centre of our culture. It's what people celebrate births, marriages, deaths, and every point in between here with. It's where people meet up. It's what they do when they uh, have any form of social interaction, and so at the same, so so alcohol is absolutely central to our culture of all Western cultures, and every Western culture has its own way of dealing with it with alcohol problems, and uh, they uh, and it, at the same time, alcohol causes all these difficulties. Now, how how those problems are regular is a wider social problem. It's not something that seems to me to be useful to define it very narrowly to reduce it to an issue of health because that's not actually the role that alcohol plays in people's lives and that you can say oh if only you knew that alcohol was bad for your health then you would drink less uh, it's just a fantasy it's just wishful thinking and I think 
you know, <laughs> Claire's very strongly motivated, and I could, you know, it's a very familiar experience. Once, you know, as any GP sees these problems every day of the week, and it's a very powerful thing that you think, if only you could do something to prevent it. But what you have to establish is before you get out of your consulting room and get on your soapbox, that what you are going to say, there's some evidence that it is likely to be beneficial in relation to the problem that you've identified. And that's the problem here. That all these policies are then constructed on the basis of this powerful urge, you know, if only we could do something about this problem, uh, then we should, you know, do this. But doing, doing what's recommended, screening patients, these brief interventions, it act, first of all, it doesn't work. And second, it's, not, it's never going to work. You know, I mean, I think so it's, what's the why the social response? Then? Well, I, you know, that's, why ask me, Tony? You know, I'm a doctor, well, I'm a no, GP. No, no. Why remember, ask remember, I read out your biography. Interest in politics, ideas, yeah. and the Enlightenment no, for see, several decades. Well, so I'm not asking you as a GP. Well, yeah, no, but you see, this is the thing. You see, we've got we've got a, 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 an excellent gastroenterologist, <coughs> liver specialist. We've got a, a highly qualified GP of the an eminent figure in the Royal College of GPs. And you're asking them about what society should do about drink. You know, you're asking me as a GP what society should do about drink. I don't know. You know, I'm not a uh, 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 I'm not an expert in, in social policy legislation and, and, and any of these other areas. And I think okay. we could have a wider discussion about it. I can give you my opinion. But as a GP, my opinion is not worth listening to on this question okay. uh, any more than anybody else's. And I would say this is the, the, the par part of the whole problem that case that people are talking outside their sphere of expertise. <laughs> You should see a gastroenterologist if you've got a gastroenterological problem. You should see a GP if you've got a medical problem. You should not consult them about social and legislative problems. Okay. Otherwise, right. you end up in trouble. I'm going to very, very quickly go to the audience, but I just want to go to the psychologist then. Let's forget the GPs. Do we have a social problem? Has something changed in our society that means alcohol is playing a different role? No. No. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> the audience is dead keen to get in. Right. Uh, this gentleman here in the grey jacket, please. Uh, do we have a microphone? Thanks very much. Um, Ready? <laughs> it's not on. Is it on? Can you turn it on? It's on. It is on, right. Um, well, could we perhaps look at the obvious parallel with smoking? Absolutely. Because there has been a reduction in smoking mm. because partly of interventions by medical services. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. This gentleman here, we're going to take a, a few points. Well, you, you go first, then pass it back. Um, I, I think you let Mike up a little bit just then, because uh, if it's a social problem, that's all of us, so we can all comment on it. Uh, so you don't have to blame the GP sat to make that uh, distinction. Uh, and I think the difficulty is um, that you, if you put this into the context of, uh, I think the, the speaker just said, this is the second campaign that's been led where there's a coalition between the medical profession in general especially the BMA and the government, about adapting the populace's behaviour. That's the context within, within which this discussion is being had. It's a political context. Uh, and I don't think you're going to make sense of this unless you deal with that issue. Uh, and then, uh, if you look at that, then you can say, well, yes, something might have happened to make alcohol prone to intervention. Uh, uh, for instance, a change in behaviour, the way people drink, etc., Maybe women are drinking more than they have in the past or whatever. But that's not the point. The point is it's opened up uh, a sphere within which we can medicalise a problem, we can then uh, insist that something is done, and then the government acts together with the medical profession to control our behaviour. And that's the thing that concerns me, uh, and that's the thing I think we, we need to open up in this discussion. We, OK, we, thank we, you. We have, a, we have a problem here with this idea that you're not allowed tell anybody about their behaviour. So, uh, well, uh, no, no, but I, I just wanted right, to give okay. the audience a chance. So remember yeah. that yeah. point. I don't imagine you'll forget it. That gentleman there. So just... Oh. Let, there you are. I was just wondering, um, on this left side, this idea of prevention, um, there's been an idea said that uh, we know, we know that what drinking does to us. But I think there's an extent to which we believe it, and we'd like to deceive ourselves that uh, there are problems. And I was wondering if the recent approach with um, smoking packets, uh, whether that was uh, treating us as infants, um, or even objectionable on the grounds it's just humorous. Uh, recently I saw a packet with a, a man in a mall with a cover over his head, and I thought that was just absurd. Um, but perhaps it gets the message home, and that, is that patronizing? Or? Okay, good question, thanks. Right, I'm going to go back and uh, along. So, uh, 
Yeah, Piers <coughs> Baines, please. Oh, thank you. So is it on? Oh, just shout. Okay. It is on, it is on. Um, I just want to return to the question of intervention, because we heard um, quite a lot about short-term interventions and the, the, the dispute about whether they're effective or not. Um, I happen to know a number of people who work in the field, though, of... Um, um, of alcohol studies and, um, and alcohol treatment centres and so on. And at least one of them has actually openly said that there is no evidence whatsoever that treatment is effective for alcoholism and perhaps other addictions. And indeed that of those alcoholics who recover, most do so without any treatment at all, whether that's medical treatment or intervention or rehab or self-help fellowships like AA. And I also, in that connection, and can I just genuinely interested in what you think about this, um, AA, for example, um, has this idea, which is very influential in the medical profession and elsewhere, that the true alcoholic, or the alcoholic, has a, a disease which renders them literally powerless over alcohol. That's the first step of AA. We admitted we were powerless. Now, I certainly passed a drunk a phenomenal amount myself, uh, which in fact brought me to the attention of the medical services. So I do know something of this. I know something of the nightmare of dependence. But I never at one time thought I was powerless. And most alcoholics I know say the same thing. They don't. And I just wonder whether there's some parallel here with other things like homosexuality. I'll, I'll wind up in a minute. I mean, at one time, homosexual disposition was regarded as a, as a vice. Then it was a disease. And then in the early 70s, in 1973, for some reason, the AMA decided it was not a disease. It was a life choice, at least to practice it. I wonder whether something similar is going to happen with addiction generally. Vice, then disease, very popular. Finally, people will recognise that this is a life choice, not to be an alcoholic, but to drink, I should say, and that it's perfectly humanly understandable that all of us at some time make choices quite deliberately that we know full well are bad for us. Thanks very much. I just think, so we've got two microphones. So on this side of the room, uh, if that can go up to the back, the lady in purple and the gentleman in purple, uh, and then that microphone... There's a song, lady in purple. <laughs> okay, maybe we lady in red. <laughs> I think it just takes a while to warm up, so just Thank keep you. going. Right, well, I, I really feel I must depend, defend the temperance movement um, because uh, I actually actually did some research into this because I was looking for an, unple a, a, an unfavorable parallel to draw with eco um, a while ago. And I was actually shocked at how great the temperance movement was. Um, and the reason it was great was that uh, temperance was only a small part of it. The, now, I'm talking about the American example because that's where I'm from, but the Christian women's temperance movement, their slogan was do everything. Um, and so not only did they campaign against alcohol, but they campaigned for the vote for women, they campaigned for, uh, against <coughs> labor, they campaigned for schools, they did literally everything. And I think it's just a real, a real uh, if you kind of broaden the discussion, I'm trying to put it in some context. It just shows how un ambitious the times we live in are, because you know rather than um, rather than seeing uh, uh, alcohol as part of a much broader uh, social uh, part of a part of a context, it seems to me what we've done is we've narrowed our horizons to try to preserve our bodies a little bit longer. Um, and I mean, I, I I'd be interested to hear what the panel think about this, but I do think that you know there is a certain amount of wear and tear that happens uh, you know, just in the course of living. And some of that is a consequence of having some alcohol. And you know, perhaps it's better to have, uh, to have a full life than to uh, prolong uh, your life for a few, you know, for a few more uh, months or years and, 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 uh, and not have any enjoyment. OK. Thank you very much. So the gentleman next to you, uh, yeah. then this gentleman here. I will get you all in eventually. Um, I, I wanted to take the discussion out of the kind of more extreme end of what turns up in the surgery or the, um, you know, the A and E on a Friday and Saturday night, and look at maybe some of the broader uh, problems to do with incivility on um, public streets, which many of us are familiar with um, in the UK on a Friday, Saturday, and many other nights of the week now. And I think Peter, for instance, whilst you cite your mass observation. Uh, quote there from the 1930s. I'm, I'm not 100% convinced just from that that it was on the same scale as, as some of what we're seeing today. Now, the real point, however, that I want to make is that incivility and drunk-like behaviour outside of pubs has very little to do with the volumes of alcohol consumed. 
it is actually part of a broader social problem that, that, that we're noticing nowadays. Uh, just to expand on that a bit more, all of you on the panel and myself are of an age where when we uh, started drinking when we were young, we learned from our peers that the half of the aim of drinking was to be able to pretend that you weren't drunk and that you were still perfectly in control and capable of doing you know, normal things. So you drank a hell of a lot, um, but still tried to operate essentially normally. In that sense, uh, what, how people behave when they're drunk is a form of learnt behaviour. We now live in a society which has got a much more me, 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 let it all hang out, touchy-feely, you know, emote, go zany and be crazy uh, aspect to it, where people drink maybe half a pint and then start burying their ass, you know, out on the street um, and, you know, performing various blue backs or, you know, just acting in a slightly incivil way. And I think you know, that's quite an important point that actually you know, what a lot of the public perceive as drunken behaviour actually has very little to do with volumes of alcohol being consumed. Actually, a certainly um, Gray's point at the beginning that volumes of alcohol consumed are going up is entirely false and indeed, um, you know, disclaimed by the government's own literature uh, on, on these facts itself. Ultimately, I think the real question we have to address is if people are drinking to escape the humdrum of their lives, Surely the key is to address the humdrum of their lives rather than the drinking. Okay, thanks very much. Over here. Yeah. Um, a track here. A couple, couple of quick things. I mean, I was quite disappointed with your comeback, I have to say, on this. Um, if it happens to you, it's 100%. You know, have the liver sclerosis. Because that, that's like, it's the worst point that the worst politicians make when they're talking about an issue. So if it's about crime or paedophilia, or anything like this. They come back and say, yes, it might be one in a million, but if it happens to you, it's 100%, and you think, you tosser, right? <laughs> because it is a disgusting point. It's a disgraceful point. And I'm really shocked that uh, a medical man will use that sort of rhetoric to make a point, because it's the lowest form of argument, as far as I'm concerned. The one in 10, I'm interested in this, one in 10 people are dependent on alcohol. I'd like a little bit of fleshing out about that. I mean, am I one of these people? Because I, I drink excessively. Um, not, see me afterwards. Not, not alcohol, <laughs> that's why I don't want to see I'll do alcohol. a surgery out there. Uh, but I'd like, to, I'd like to know what this... Uh, Just needs a brief intervention, I'd surely. I'd like to know what this one in 10 is. But I thought this was a really interesting point about the temperance movement. Because just to broaden it out, I'm interested. I've just been looking at the issue of violence. I'm speaking after this on the scale of the kids thing. I just start to look at these papers on violence, World Health uh, Organization on violence, and it's all about prevention, right? Prevention. And I think if there was a, a slogan today that Labour was going to put out, it would be prevention, prevention, prevention. And it's not just. And they've taken up a medical model for violence. And I am interested in this. What is is this? This framework of prevention seems to be quite an interesting thing to try and unpick. Whereas I think the temperance thing is interesting because there they seem to have some aspirations as well as trying to prevent. Today, the framework of prevention seems to be quite a, a very limited sort of framework to address social problems. Okay, thanks very much. I'm going to let the, there's a lot on the table and some strong comments have been made. So I just want to let the panel respond to those briefly and then I'll come back and, and get everybody else in. So, Ray, you first. You wanted to take up this point about behaviour modification. You might want to respond to that gentleman well, uh, as you like. <laughs> having, having been uh, thought of as similar to a politician, I don't really think there's any comeback. I mean, what I said stands. It's very simple. If you get some devastating illness, it's very bad luck. Uh, the risk may be small, but if it happens to you, it's dreadful. So I, I, I make no apology for making that remark. The second thing is that... There seems to be a feeling here that if illness is related to behaviour, it then becomes a no-go area for the doctor. It's, you know, if a patient comes in with a cancer, you say, poor chap, you know, we'll, we'll give you treatment for that. If you've got heart failure, you're a poor person, you know, we'll give you some water tablets and take the fluid away from your ankles. But if the patient is doing something that causes them harm, that's a free choice and that's okay. So things like smoking are a no-go area, Alcohol is a no-go area. Obesity is a no-go area. That's, that cannot be correct. If somebody is damaging themselves, you might just mention in passing that the alcohol is bad for them and it would be sensible to give it up. 
Uh, we don't have any power to stop people. And I've already made the point that there are yep. two different types of patients with an alcohol problem. There are those patients who are alcoholics in inverted commas, um, and simple interventions don't work with them. And then there are people who live in ignorance, it's bravado, whatever it is, um, whom you can bring up short. Um, and, I, you know, I think we do have to tell people about the behaviour. It's not paternalistic, it's just part of the normal medical interaction uh, with, with, with the patients. Um, and, uh, you know, to think this is a no-go area, you might as well actually stop being a doctor because an awful lot of your practice revolves around trying to ask people to be sensible about their behaviour. Okay, thanks. Claire, and could you, the one question sort of directed perhaps towards you about inf in infantilising people. So you, you all want to talk to people, you want to do the brief intervention. But are you actually treating them I, like I, children? I certainly aren't not treating patients like children. I heard a fantastic speech the other day where doctors were described as guests in their patients' lives. And I would like to think that I'm a guest in my patients' lives, but one that has information that, if you wish uh, me to inform you, uh, that's why I go to medical school and you spent vast amounts of money training me. So I don't, I don't think it's infantilising to say to a 54-year-old man who's drinking 100 units a week, who's hypertensive, that actually reducing your alcohol might might prevent you having a stroke uh, in five years' time. I certainly don't think that's infantilising. I just wanted to pick up the issue that, that, that alcohol is complex, which is what I said at my... You know, it's not as simple as tobacco. There is no dose-related curve to tobacco. All tobacco is harmful, whereas not all alcohol is harmful and not everybody that drinks gets harm. So it isn't as, it isn't as clear-cut. But the other thing, unlike tobacco, of course, is that whilst we have a right... To drink, we don't have a right to harm each other when we drink. And even from the example that was read out, uh, a fight, a public brawl, to me is harming others. And that's why alcohol is complex. That's why we can't just leave it to the individual, because actually it doesn't just affect the individual. And the third point I'd like to pick up is treatment. I have the <coughs> honour now of running a service for sick doctors and dentists with alcohol problems or substance misuse. And we've heard how many doctors and dentists uh, get into serious problems with, with alcohol. Given the right treatment, which uh, the evidence shows that if you give the right treatment, uh, about 80% of doctors, where the research has done, are, are abstinent at 20 years. So 80% are abstinent at 20 years. So given the right intervention, treatment does work. So please don't go away from this route thinking, I drink heavily, my loved one drinks heavily, oh God, there's nothing I can do, medicine can't help. That is a fallacy. We can help. And given the right intervention, we can sort it out. And, and if abstinence, if you're dependent or non-dependent drinkers, uh, can do control drinking. Okay, thanks very much. Mike, and you've got the uh, temperance question directed at you and whatever else you want to pick up on. Well, I'd just like to, I mean, I don't know, you know, I, I don't really have anything to add on the temperance, temperance question uh, historically, <coughs> but I think, the, I, I, I think Claire's point is very apposite about the smoking. I think the, the parallel is not appropriate. There, there are very significant differences, but not in the way that Claire has said, but also in terms of the deep-rooted nature of, of the place of alcohol in our culture, which doesn't compare <laughs> with the cigarette smoking was a relatively short episode and in, in its direct dose relationship to illness as, as, as Claire identified is, is um, uh, quite different but I, I also think there's an interesting parallel to be drawn between the early phase and the late phase of the campaign against smoking I think if you look the very first uh, publicity about the link between cigarette smoking and cancer in the 50s and then kind of gathered momentum in the 60s at a time we should remember the British Medical Journal carried ad adverts for smoking for cigarettes um, that information was disseminated widely in the public and had a major effect. Over a, a period of time, the proportion of people smoking dropped quite dramatically from the 60s and 70s onwards. Without major intrusive propaganda of the sort that's characterised the last 10 years, uh, particularly around the whole propaganda about, about passive smoking and the uh, bans on smoking and all the rest of it, all justified with some very dubious... Uh, scientific, uh, which many people regard as an abuse of uh, epidemiology, to exaggerate the uh, potential dangers of passive smoking, to justify more, more coercive policies, which also, interestingly, have been vastly less effective than the early phase of, of uh, the anti-smoke, when, when simple information was provided to the public. And so, if you look over the last 10 years, actually the, the proportion of smoking has fallen, has fallen very little, and the proportion of young people smoking has actually increased. So that 
sort of coercive, intrusive, moralising propaganda, the sort that you mentioned about the sort of adverts that are now being put out, actually is not effective uh, and, you know, uh, arguably is, um, creates a whole atmosphere around the issue of smoking where the smoker has become a pariah, it's a highly stigmatised activity, it's created an enormous amount of guilt and anxiety. One of the big themes of current propaganda is to make children anxious about their parents smoking so that children are used to coerce their parents uh, into smoking. That's a central theme of the recent smoking propaganda, which it seems to me is a, a very um, a very un insidious sort of state propaganda uh, in relation to that. So I think that, uh, that that's a, a, an interesting sort of area, and I think it illustrates the sort of um, abuse of science in relation to public health, what we now also see in relation to alcohol. I mean, I, I think, as I've said, I don't think there's any dispute that alcohol causes harm. It does seem to me, I mean, somebody wrote a, Lee Jones wrote a good article on Spiked about the, uh, how the, how the uh, figures of alcohol-related deaths, indeed the figures of deaths from cirrhosis, tend to be inflated in various ways over recent years to, to exaggerate, it seems to me, the scale of the so-called epidemic of alcohol-related uh, illness. That's a feature of every uh, panic around alcohol that we've had over the last two, 300 years. Uh, to, to create a greater atmosphere of public alarm, which is held to be in some way beneficial. The, the whole thing around this is that if, you gener you know, if you're a doctor and you experience these harms in your surgery, then you, 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 you want to generate more, uh, you feel strongly about it, you want to generate more public anxiety, you exaggerate the scale of the problem, you create a sense of public alarm around the issue, but unfortunately, the interventions that follow on from it don't uh, uh, yield the results that you have. And I dispute uh, Claire's notion that this is not, uh, uh, doesn't have a paternalistic and patronising element. I think it's to be distinguished the sort of case that she describes of where you have a patient with clearly alcohol-related harm in relation to their health and they come to you to, to discuss what's to be done about it and you discuss alcohol in relation to that. That's to be distinguished from the activity that now GPs are systematically being pushed into of screening all their patients for their alcohol consumption and systematically briefly intervening uh, in their lives to, to advise them what they should do. Now you don't conduct such brief interventions in uh, people's behaviour when they're the guests in your house. You know, that's not the, 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 the kind of guest-related activity that uh, a doctor should be engaging in. Thanks, Mike. Peter, for me. Measured in simply presenting evidence, which then much later went to this rather lurid, you know, um, idea of sort of putting pictures of people's diseased lungs on cigarette packets and so on, is, is having much less effect and indeed in some cases may be actually having um, unexpected um, counter effects. I'll just touch on a, a couple of things. The idea that um, being drunk is a learned behaviour um, is absolutely right. We have to learn not only to drink but to be drunk. A very good example of this is, um, well, a couple of decades ago now it was, but some English football fans found themselves in Ajax's stadium um, in Holland. And unbeknown to them, the authorities there had switched the beer to alcohol-free beer, uh, but it still had a sort of continental label, label on it. They all got absolutely pissed, <laughs> reeled around the place, and, and caused um, a lot of trouble. Um, so clearly the expectations you have and the kind of models that you set up um, have much more influence, I think, over drinking behaviour than so-called medical advice. And I think if we are going to tackle any of the problems, and I agree with Bill, yes, I mean, some of this behaviour we find in the streets is boorish, unpleasant, and frankly, um, I keep out of George Street in the middle of Oxford on, on Friday nights. I'm far too old for that kind of stuff. But just on this business of medical advice and how, you know, through the early interventions and that kind of stuff, you can actually achieve some effect... As far as I understand it, the dose-related curve for alcohol and harm is in fact J-shaped. Yes. That at the bottom of that distribution, you, or you have a tail, where people who don't drink anything at all are actually less healthy than people who drink small, moderate amounts. Mm. So why aren't we coercing all these sodding teetotalers into having a beer now and again? This would seem to me a reasonable sort of health <laughs> initiative, you know, to rescue um, these poor teetotalers um, from their problems and sort of bring them back into a sort of much more healthy lifestyle. Especially okay. pregnant women. Absolutely. Women. Interesting question. Right. Can I just get a sense of who wants to speak so I can get you all in? Um, right. So, I'm, don't, I'm not ignoring you. I'm going to get you in. Um, so, that lady there, then the gentleman in the pullover uh, behind her, and then this lady here in the blue top, 
Just there. Yeah. Okay. Um, Tom very sensibly said that alcohol is complex. Uh, information is also complex. I'd um, just like to share some findings from some youth research that's just been done by 11 million. And the young people on that said this. They said, we are confused about the information. The government is telling us that alcohol is unhealthy. On the other hand, we see pissed celebrities falling out of nightclubs, and we all want to be celebrities because we watch The X Factor. So the people we glamorise are pissed. On the other hand... We've got alcohol, which is incredibly cheap. Now, if the government really does think that alcohol is doing us harm, why is it so cheap? We're confused. The messages are mixed. Thank you very much. And then the gentleman behind you in the pullover, and this lady, be before he speaks, you go. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'd also like to highlight my earlier point, the lady just now, about mixed messages. And I think a prime example at the moment is with pregnant women and alcohol, which you yourself touched on. Poor pregnant women at the moment have been bombarded so many messages about how to keep healthy, health their unborn fetus. And alcohol is particularly bad. On the one hand, they've been told no, you shouldn't drink it. On the other hand, they've been told, oh, maybe you can have some. And the poor people are left weighing up how to make a decision and feeling probably very guilty about whether they do have a drink or not, which is going to cause more harm than good eventually. Mm. OK, thanks very much. Uh, so, yes, that gentleman there, and then if you could bring it forward. Hi there. I'd just like to come back with a question for Mr. Fitzpatrick, actually. That made, he made the comment that GPs are retreating from their area of expertise, and he, gave, he went on to give an example of becoming involved in the policy-making process. But is one of the problems not in the public health policy-making process, the seeming vacuum of medical expertise in the House of Commons? How many medical practitioners actually sit in that house? So, in fact, the con is the conclusion we not draw from that, that we need more GPs, not less, who have actual experience on the ground to become engaged in the process? Thank you very much. Uh, could you pass it uh, right to the very back? Uh, yeah. Um, on a slight sort of tangential kind of uh, uh, note, um, because the whole sort of discussion um, around booze has sort of opened up the kind of uh, scope to intervene, uh, on people's behaviour as I see it. Um, you know, where it's going to go is, uh, for example, with diabetes. Um, you know, you could questionably say that the causes are not so <coughs> readily understood, but that doesn't mean that, you know, we aren't going to continue to preach to um, uh, diabetics or those who are supposedly going to be diabetic because they have a waistline over 34 inches and so on, to really, uh, you know, impinge on their behaviour, their lifestyle and so on. And it's just a really great example of what we're going to probably see more of, where you get the posters on the high streets and you get the dietitians in the surgeries who are haranguing you to uh, eat properly and so on. And so it's a continuation of this whole sort of intervention kind of approach. And it is unhealthy because it's not necessarily based on, on good science and good understanding. Thanks very much. Um, right, so there's the person right at the very back, then Jennifer Cunningham, then David Oliver, and then anybody else. Um, yeah, I was in hospital recently um, for an ovarian cyst in torsion, was, which was extremely painful. I was on very high levels of morphine. And my pain was heightened by the fact that about four times a day, I was asked about my level of alcohol consumption <laughs> um, and, and, and my smoking and, and whether I ate healthily or not. And obviously these things had no relationship to the medical problem um, for, which, for which I was in extreme amounts of pain and which needed sorted out and which actually wasn't sorted out exactly in the end. Um, and I think that's a quite <coughs> common experience now. You go... Uh, to GPs, and you get, you know, it's almost like going to a GP is a, is a, is a prerequisite to, uh, get, to ask you about your smear tests, to tell you about your weight, and the, the actual medical problem for which people go in is often, you know, is often not prioritised, and so I think it's not just that people are told about their alcohol consumption if, if they go in for an alcohol-related illness, I think you go in for something completely unrelated, you get lectured about that, and I think that that is a sign of the fact that this has become a kind of, you know, a real moral mission for GPs, and has has become slightly irrational in terms of the, the kind of uh, priority that's placed on it. And I think actually in many cases could damage the sort of quality of medical care that people are receiving because it's placed um, above the very pressing medical problems that people are presenting with. Okay, thanks very much. That microphone there to David Oliver in the middle and the other one is Jennifer Cunningham. Right, well, okay, an observation and a question really. My observation is all of the panel are right. The evidence that alcohol is linked to health problems is incontrovertible. I uh, don't want to get into a debate about the evidence, but it's there. And even Mike agrees, he said so, okay? Mike's right that the government tend to spin uh, evidence into more than it is to suit their policies or to ignore the evidence about interventions, you know, to suit their ends. So the 
talking about a long track record of doing that. And you're right, <coughs> alcohol is always in the UK. If you go back to the top field, he describes a nation of booze as in the 18th century. The very fact that something has always been a problem, or may not be more prevalent than it used to be, doesn't make it not a problem. So I think you're all right. But my question is, what actually works in terms of modifying behaviour? And there are a couple of recent examples. One is HIV, where there was a clear campaign about unsafe sex, and it did work, and it did modify behaviour in high risk communities. And about smoking, you know, the argument about smoking and its link to health problems is long since dead, and people have modified their behaviour. So the real question is, what works? If it's not for the intervention, is it completely futile for the public to try and, uh, for the government to try and modify the public health? Should they just wash their hands there? Okay, thanks. Would you, yeah, Thank Jennifer you. Cunningham, and then then you there. I just wanted to um, come back to this point about the alliance between medicine and and politics at the moment. Um, to make the point that it really, I think, in my in my view, it's a really unholy alliance, and I think it stems from a real loss of confidence in both parties on the part of politicians, the confidence to actually pursue ideas in the realm of social policy and, and, and you know, social ideas to meet various problems and, and a real crisis of confidence in the medical profession, particularly primary care, about their role. And obviously there are a lot of problems in society and I'm completely with Mike Fitzpatrick on this, that doctors I think are very, very worried about their role and are constantly trying to redefine it increasingly around becoming psychologists and psychiatrists and therapists of, of various sort. But I think the consequence of this alliance is that they both have an interest in promoting some of these so-called health scares. And I think that's very, very dangerous for us. I accept the points, the qualifications Mike made about t um, tobacco smoking, but the recent campaigns are amongst the most coercive campaigns I can imagine. Imagine coercing whole nations into not smoking <coughs> in certain places. Coerce a whole nation into certain you know, forms of, of, of behavior and so on. You just wonder where the alcohol scare can go to in terms of its coercive um, <coughs> you know, direction once you set a precedent, you know, like some of the, the controls on, on smoking. The other side of this, of course, is the, f the, the point that people have raised about the guilt that it actually, you know, uh, it evokes in people. So I'm a pediatrician, so I see the consequence, you know, in, 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 in mothers and, and parents you know, who are now really, really concerned about the effects of alcohol, you know, on the fetus and on their child's development, without cause, in my opinion. Thank you very much. Any last contributions? You're, you're okay? Right, so very quickly, uh, one, two, three. So there's a gentleman in the green jacket at the top. There's, je yeah, whoever's closest, that guy there in the black, thank you. Yeah, I, I also had uh, two Scotch relatives who uh, sort of drank themselves to death, really. But they were, I think it was probably because um, I mean, they, were, they lived in 1930s Glasgow, which wasn't particularly pleasant, and then they went to, to Auschwitz, burying the bodies. So I think that, that was probably caused through that. So what I was trying to say was, I mean, <clears throat> do you think that, that now that, you know, your, your whoever it was, relative, father probably uh, drank himself to death because of it? what it like in the, in the 1930s Glasgow and isn't, I think like most people have said, it's just, yeah, alcohol is a, it's a social problem um, and we're not dealing with the social problems, we're trying to just, well, cover over it by looking for any other excuse. Thank you very much. This gentleman's here. I think, I think there's two ways to fix the problem and unfortunately brief intervention is not one of them. Um, there's an easy way and a hard way. Um, the hard way I'll start with and that's to change the whole culture. Um, to a southern European culture. I'll give you one example. Um, in New Zealand, they had a big campaign to reduce drunk driving, and that was successful in uh, reducing the rates of death by about half on the roads. I mean, if you have a big enough campaign, you can change the culture of a specific aspect. I um, mean, the easy way is to put up the price. Um, and whenever you put up the price of tobacco or alcohol, the rates go down, and that was a large part of the uh, rates of smoking going down as well. And I think that it, 
it's a societal problem. It needs to be societal kind of solutions rather than an individual. Thank you very much. There was one last one there, and then it's back. To the I wonder where the government um, sort of suggested limits on drinking come from scientifically. <laughs> the reason is there is quite a lot of good evidence that moderate drinking is quite good for you if you're middle-aged. A lot of good evidence that is quite good for you. And, and I've seen a number of talks by fairly eminent epidemiologists in this country which have, have established that with large studies, okay? Observational studies, non-interventional studies, but still. So the question is, where is the crossover? How good is the science? You know, what is it, four, four units a day? I mean, is it three, is it six? That's important, I think, for a lot of us who perhaps worry that we might be drinking a bit too much, which is perhaps why a lot of us have come to this, <laughs> this, this session. And so my question is, how good is the science behind those limits? How seriously do we have to take it? You might get different answers. Um, OK, right, thank you very much to the audience. Uh, in reverse order, then, <laughs> final thoughts, please, from the panel. Uh, so, Peter, you first. Um, let's take the last point first. You know, the idea of is it three units, four units, five units, or what have you? And is that right across the board, independent of your age, lifestyle, weight, and so on? Um, clearly, these are very crude, and I think that's why a lot of confusion exists, because, frankly, people cannot believe that the recommend recommended limits are so low. Um, it's been like, you know, five fruit and veg a day. You know, where did that come from? Why isn't it three fruit and veg? Um, in Sweden, it's seven fruit and veg a day. You, you have to eat. And, and people, you know, frankly switch off when you start throwing these kind of numbers to them. Um, we did some work some years ago with the British Army on alcohol-related problems in the British Army. They suddenly discovered they had some, and soldiers drank rather a lot and occasionally got into fights in pubs in Aldershot and places like that. And these were in the early days of when the units had just been <coughs> defined. And there, I think, there was a case for education because most of the soldiers had interpreted the 21 or 27 units as an evening's drinking because that sort of fitted much more with their experience of life than, than, than before. Um, I don't think they need to be told again. Um, this idea that, OK, I'm, I'm accused of saying, well, you know, Binge drinking and these boorish behaviours, you know, go back in history. Um, in fact, they go back to the 15th century, 16th century. And the idea is, therefore, it doesn't really matter. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that these are entrenched kinds of behaviours and arguing that they come out of very deep-seated cultural traditions driven primarily by Puritan temperance um, approaches, which have always been founded on restriction that alcohol is such a dangerous kind of substance that it must be hedged about in this kind of way. So what I'm arguing is, let's accept that these are not novel problems. They haven't come since 1960s when we all started allegedly drinking a lot more than we did before. These are timeless problems, and we need to unpick the very factors that are responsible for the problems in the first place. And those are the heavy level of um, coercion, the heavy levels of restriction, getting back to the idea that drinking alcohol is a normal everyday event as it is in Italy and elsewhere. And if we can sort of, we need to work on that cultural change. Okay, it takes longer and perhaps makes less money than sort of putting up the price of booze. But it seems to me if we're serious about tackling these issues, that rather than a medical approach, either early interventions or something much more um, uh, dramatic, I mean, that seems the way to go. Thanks, Peter. Mike. Um, well, there's a lot of interesting points have been raised. Um, somebody asked about, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, it would be better if we had more GPs in the political realm. I think if you knew as many GPs as I do, you'd be more sceptical about that. Um, it just seems to me that what we, you know, there's a problems that arise from the blurring of professional boundaries here. You know, that doctors are, should stick to being doctors and politicians should stick to being politicians and we'd all be better off in these sort of areas. I think... Uh, uh, the problems arise from people operating outside their spheres of expertise, and uh, that creates all sorts of difficulties. I think somebody made the point, I think, very accurately at the back about the problem that's now created for people going in to see doctors because of the whole strength of the way doctors are incentivized to conduct these preventive activities. And, the, you know, uh, doctors are, uh, are driven 
by incentive schemes to uh, intervene in people's behaviour. And it's what the problem that people come in the surgery with becomes secondary to ticking the boxes about whether they've had their blood pressure, their smear, all these other things that uh, have been mentioned, and their units of alcohol computed. And I think that is creating a very serious uh, distorting effect on the whole nature of medical practice. It's a very big problem, I think, which is greatly underestimated and is, is a result of all these, pre the, the whole idea of, of GPs being able to solve every social problem in, in the world. You know, this, the underlying thing is about all these problems is something must be done and GPs are the people to do it. Well, you know, GPs can't do it. And the idea that something must be done only is useful if the something which is being proposed is a substantiated scientific, there is some scientific basis for it. And you know, people, uh, Claire can comment authoritatively on where the units came from. You know, it came from a, a bunch of psychiatrists who uh, plucked it out of thin air. And you're not going to get any answer to your question. It's something you're going to have to work out for yourself, I'm afraid. That's the simple truth of the matter. And everybody here will have to work it out for themselves. And it's a problem for everybody in living and growing up in this society. It, we, alcohol is a problem for everybody. And you have to work out for yourself how you deal with it. And there's no, you know, your doctor is not going to be able to give you an authoritative guide uh, to, so it's, it, you're not going to get an answer there. I would, you know, in the era that one of the great slogans that's come out of the whole world of evidence-based medicine is the slogan, not widely enough promulgated, don't just do something, stand there. You know? Don't just do something, stand there. Because one of the things that has emerged out of the whole you know, uh, development of evidence-based medicine is the recognition that so much of interventions that doctors have been doing for years are neither effective nor often safe. Don't just do something, stand there. Until what you, you, know, you know what you're going to do has some validity, that has some real solid evidence that it's going to work. And that's the trouble with these interventions that are all being put forward here. The, the, it is wishful thinking that, as I've tried to substantiate about brief interventions, I think you could say the same thing about the, as, as has been made out about the more systematic interventions. Everybody would like them to work too. You know, on the wider cultural question, it seems to me my personal experience of dealing with uh, uh, people with problems of, of dependence on alcohol and drugs and everything else is, you know, why do people, st you hear it very interesting to, to ask people, you look, you see people and they, they come back and you see, oh, they were, had a big drug problem or a big drink problem, they stopped doing it. You say, well, why did you stop doing it? And it very rarely has anything to do with any detox, rehab or intervention. It's something else happened in their life. They found something more interesting to do, is the simple truth of the matter. And this is the thing in culture more widely. People stop, will stop drinking to, to excess when they find something more interesting to do in their lives. They'll stop taking drugs when they find something more interesting. When they find a relationship that is useful and means something in their lives, when they found something, some activity, some hobby, some job, you know, something changes in their lives that they make that move forward. It's nothing to do with the pharmacology of the actual substance and some regime imposed in relation to that. It's a wider question. It's a wider social, cultural, political question. That's why it's not susceptible to these sort of medical solutions. And it's wishful thinking, and wishful thinking with damaging consequences to think it could be otherwise. Thank you very much, Mike. OK, I just Claire. want to say three things. The pregnant women issue, I think, has been a disgrace. I think the Department of Health lied uh, when it gave out the, the, that you shouldn't drink. What utter tosh. There is no evidence at all that you should abstain when pregnant. And the figures, that the, the evidence on fetal alcohol were done on women in the States who drank a bottle and a half of whiskey a day. And I think to go from that... That's number one. Number two, I am not in favour of screening. I think screening everybody that walks through the door, again, is something that I would... I would advocate against time and time and time again. And if your GP asks you what your alcohol consumption is, I think you need to say to them, I actually don't want it recorded, because I think it's, it, it's something you need to protect yourself. Screening or, or discussing with patients who I think have harm-related, alcohol-related harm is not the same as screening. It's secondary prevention, but I'm not in screening. In terms of the <coughs> units, I would just like to say... You have a problem, or you should consider yourself to have a problem, if you can't remember what you did last night. If you've ever had a drink-drive offence, if you've ever felt guilty about the amount you've drunk, or who somebody who's close to you has actually suggested that you should cut down your drinking. Now, whether that is on two units a day, 20 units a day, or the, 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 the most I've ever had a patient, 100 units a day, that is up to you. Don't count it on units, count it on that. And I think... If any of those are, are, are ticked, then I can't predict whether you're going to have uh, cirrhosis of the liver or dementia or breast cancer, but I do say you need to think seriously about the amount of alcohol you're drinking. Thank you. Claire, great, please. Thank you very much. Um, 
I, I, I think one of the problems I detect is that if the government is involved, somehow uh, it, it, it's, it's not fair, it's, it's unreasonable. Um, Alcohol-related problems are behaviorally linked 100%, so you have to modify behavior. I think when the problem is of the scale and cost and size that it is, government inevitably will be involved. Uh, I made the point right at the beginning that I thought the nomenclature was confusing, I thought the terminology was confusing, and I also happen to think, too, that the alcohol units message is confusing. You know, is it 21, is it 28? Well, you know, say one or the other. Uh, and I think Claire's point is uh, absolutely germane that it does vary from person to person. There is a continuum of damage that occurs. So there is no point at which we can tell you it's absolutely safe or it's absolutely unsafe. So a certain amount relies on common sense as well as the messages that we give you. But just because the government is involved and just because on the whole, I think most people detest this government and detest the idea of a nanny state is not a reason to say that they shouldn't be involved or that we should ignore everything that they say. And I think you do do that at your peril. Um, and I'm fed up with picking up the pieces. You know, I would really, well, at my age, I could be, but I mean, I, I would really rather be redundant in terms of looking after patients with alcoholic liver disease and not have any work to do, than to continue doing the work I had to do, all of which is far too late in the day. And it's just desperately, desperately sad. None of you in this room, apart from perhaps one or two, will have experienced this firsthand. I can't tell you how profoundly depressing and sad it is looking after these patients dying, usually very slowly and very unpleasantly. Okay, thank you very much to our panel. And uh, Claire has an outspoken uh, GP. I hope you'll be telling the Department of Health that they're still lying about. I, I tell them constantly. That